on the, the Facebooks and YouTubes and whatnot. And as soon as the clock strikes. Hello, Facebooks. Yeah, as soon as Hello. the clock strikes ready, I'll hit that. All right, here we go. More. Um, admit all. There we go. And if, Pooja, if you could keep all. an eye on admitting people. Hello, everyone. Hey, to kids. It's, like radio hour. it's excellent to see you all. Our wonderful friends throughout the world. Yeah, man. We're going down into the basement workroom today and talk about all kind of tips and tricks from our daily work. And yeah. it's going to be fun. what we if... go ahead, oh, man. I, I can't believe I cut you off. Sorry. All respect. Just continue, continue with what you were going to say. Um, what we thought would be really fun was to be keying off our, I don't know what, 60 year complete total between Ethan and I, 60 years in the piano business. Um, some high end clients, a lot of regular clients, just everything. Vox Populi for me. I've been from soup to nuts in 40 odd years. Uh, in terms of kind of pianos, where they are, who plays them. Now I'm in a place that I love with mostly really, 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 really good pianos. And I've learned a lot. I've failed every day. You know, failure is not failure. There's a big tip. There's the biggest tip you're going to get today. Why don't you tattoo this on the inside of your eyelids? You know, failure is a gift. When you, when you do something and you're not good at it and you suck at it, that's normal. That's human. That's average. You're never going to be great at something right away. So lighten up and lose your terror of failing. Oh my God, what if I fail? What if you do? Nobody cares. <laughs> you fail and you apologize and make it right and don't charge anybody for your stupidity or your ignorance and you keep going, you learn. And you learn, well, how did I react? And did the customer think I was a weirdo for getting so bummed out, and blah, blah, blah. You learn, you learn. And Carl Lieberman sits here week after week and talks about half or maybe even 60% of this business or any real custom luxury service business like this is relationship, nothing but relationship. So how you are with the client and how you are with all the stuff you got to do on the piano, instead of having a mild disdain and remove from the client and, and, and going with the context that, oh, they don't know anything and they're ignorant and I know so much. How about going with just like you don't know about air conditioners, pal, or you don't know about this, or you don't know about whatever, Tuvan throat singing or whatever it is. You just don't know. So there's my first broadside rant <laughs> of, the, of the hour about what learning really is. Learning is failing, quote, failing, unquote, and quote, succeeding, unquote. It's everything, it's life. Yeah, and I'm just gonna have to, I'm just gonna have to play devil's advocate here, David, and say, don't screw anything up and uh, <laughs> watch your back. <laughs> there you go. I'm, I'm just kidding, but um, 
yeah, I think that's that's a great great theme to to undertake. And if you, yeah, I, I think we can also just jump in too to talk about some of the things that we want to talk about today. We want about we want to fit in everything that we can. We want to talk about some, maybe some tuning, some voicing, some regulation. David and I had some a chat, a couple of chats before this, so we've got some kind of talking points outlined and basically what we want to do is bring some stuff that you know we think are kind of our top our top tips and of course i humbly do that you know um david's been around for longer than i have but uh, i'll bring you my unique perspective and maybe uh maybe a maybe a fresher perspective or a more technical yeah. perspective i think david david is uh david and i make a great match because um you're very intuitive and i'm very analytical in comparison although i've got a little bit of that intuitive side um and oh. there's both directions to approach things and we need to take both those directions but also listen to each other uh when we have differences of opinions or just even different points of view so uh yeah i think it'll be good to start so uh Without, so I don't forget, I will also just say really quickly, this is, this event's brought to you by uh, Piano Technicians Masterclasses, online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction for piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com and various ways that you can participate. So first topic, I'm just going to throw up here and that is tuning. So tips on tuning. And we were talking about, um, we were talking about, I, I have a graph, you know what, I might, I might be able to pull it up too. I don't have it prepared, but there's a graph from Mario Egrek's book um, showing kind of the overlapping inharmonicity curves from several octaves of a, of a piano, of a grand piano. And it, it kind of shows how the various partials interact. And I've noticed, um, again, from the technical side of things, if someone doesn't feel so mathematical or technical, hey, maybe they just, you know, they don't want to think about it that way. But um, I found it very useful. It, it gives me a visual picture to imagine as I'm tuning the piano and listening to the partials and how they interact. And if I can, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pull that up soon so that I can maybe display it to everyone and show you. But the basic principle that I noticed in looking at this particular curve and then experimenting with uh, my own tunings is that everything kind of, it, it, this is going to sound obvious at first, but there's more to it. Everything kind of coalesces in the mid range of the piano. And so, so that when there's, there's a lot of overlapping partials, that matter the way that I think about tuning in that mid range in the temperament octave around there more than overlapping coincident partials in other areas of the piano. So for example, if I'm trying to tune a bass note um, and the low bass, I've noticed what sounds good locally in the octave, but also balancing that with which partials from the the partial series of those bass notes, how are they interacting exactly with notes in the mid range? And typically it sounds better to me when they're sort of, when they're more aligned with the mid range note, the overlapping partials, than trying to make them align with, with lower octaves. Um, so I found this sort of an interesting pattern that I've noticed to give a nice full sound where, where it rings out quite well is to focus on how everything comes together in the mid range. And other people might have other um, perspectives. And I'll, uh, again, I'll try to bring that graph up back in to give you a, a visual of it. But David, I'm sure you have things from a totally different direction on, on I, tuning. I, I do. It's fascinating. I have, I naturally know what partials are and I can hear them and I do hear them. And I, I know how to follow the, nomenclature of tuning, but I have never listened to partials to tune a piano consciously. Oh, this is this and labeled a partial and labeled this partial. 
I never have in 40 odd years of piano tuning. I've done what Virgil Smith talked about every single time he spoke, which is, why don't you listen to the piano the way the player hears the piano? Why don't you listen to the tuning so as to make it pleasant and musical for that ear? the ear of the listener, the ear of the player. So that's what I've done. And so what you're talking about, Ethan, is just something that I have done naturally for forever in making it sound good. What's the best way, play, way what's the best place to leave this damn string? so that it sounds the best with the octaves above it and some other notes, right? Isn't that, isn't that the bottom line on a piano tuning? Yeah, I think, I think what, what's interesting, the way I've always thought about intuition is that it's, uh, it's kind of like a, you know, if you think of a computer, right? A, a computer can do a calculation, but it, it's not going to, at the same time, explain to you how it does that calculation. Right. So uh, you can give it a, a few numbers, uh, you know, seven digit numbers and put one to the exponent of the other or multiply them together. And in seconds, you'll have an answer. But if you type into your calculator, you say, how did that happen? You know, well, there's a total other person that's going to say, well, you know, here's the diagram of all the circuits and the, all of this that happens. And they're going to take quite a long, long time to actually explain how the calculator did that. And so in some sense, when you build intuition for things, there's, there's an interesting dichotomy in that you may be actual, actually able to do them quite well. Um, but at the same time, have a lot of difficulty explaining how you did that. And uh, I, I find that that's an interesting pattern that I see. And yeah. I feel like both approaches, for me, it's been helpful to take a little bit of both approaches. So one side of it is trusting my intuition, but then at the places where I'm confused or I keep doing this thing and I keep seeing a sound that I don't like, and I say, well, why did it, is that? then I might inform my understanding with some of the, these other tools, oh, listening to partials and so forth. Three million percent. Using them as protocols and tools. Absolutely. You know, and partial matching is completely legitimate and a way to get into a beautiful place. Yeah. Here's the deal. We're all going to the same place. A good tuning on a piano is a good tuning on a piano. There's not, the, you know, it's not like, oh, this guy that tunes a piano in a way that's different, you know, in terms of pattern, in terms of frequency. No, no. It's different in terms of other things. Sustain clear clearness clarity you know calm uh, fidelity you know these are the things that a master tuning can do you know but everybody's we're getting some this. we're getting some mic noise from you david just so you know i'm not sure why but uh i don't know why either i think it's you i don't think it's me yeah i think it's you I don't think anybody else is because I'm just lying here. You're just sitting there. <laughs> I'm just sitting here, totally okay. still, and nothing else is rattling or doing anything. Okay, well, I'll figure out what it is. Um, oh, one thing. One thing that I we been, have questions by the way already. Oh, so let's now. go. So let me know. <laughs> Come on, let's do it. Okay, cool. So let me just hit it from the top. Um, Ed Whitting just made a comment: real failure is not learning from mistakes. That's a valuable thing to share. Uh, Three million percent. Um, Listen, my little sister who makes more in a day than any of us here make in a week, uh, as a 
consultant and strategist to big time business leaders has written a little book called Be Bad First, which I highly recommend. It's 130, 140 pages. And it breaks down for those of you who are cerebral, like I am to a certain extent. Um, so you can really understand, wow, why do I have this tremendous terror of failing, of being, you know, of, of not doing something really, you know, pro the first time I do it. And this book, she, she, she's been in all kinds of business for quarter century and says, that's the biggest toxic strain in American business or in global business. It's people are afraid to fail. They're afraid to fail for mostly internal reasons, not much external reasons, some, but mostly because it activates their own shame and they don't like to feel that. So I checked out the book and I, I will say it's a great book. And one thing I think it, it might not absolutely do, but it can do is help you become more afraid of not learning than you are of making <laughs> mistakes. And I think that's the, that's I think a that's great the key. Context. You know, I think your sister really outlines the fact that the world is changing so rapidly, especially in this day and age. You know, maybe this wasn't true 200, definitely not 500,000 years ago. I think it was better to be more stable and, you know, stick with something. But um, the world is changing so rapidly that there's something new to learn every day. And if you kind of, if you're too, if you're too afraid to make the mistakes, you won't approach those things. And then if, if so you got to be ready and almost excited to start screwing stuff up so that you can make some progress. Yeah. Fear. What can you say? It brittleizes your mindset. You know, fear makes you brittle, makes you like weaker in a lot of ways. You know, when you see somebody who's like in my classes, you know, you, everybody talks about a, a closet full of skeletons. I say absolutely with no problem that I have a container load of skeletons. I've made every mistake you can make in the piano business. I've made some doozy mistakes on, on pianos and had to pay back a lot of money to, to on, a, on a couple of instruments I messed up pretty bad. So it's worthy investment. Pardon me? Sounds like a worthy investment. <sighs> Not that you should be there. You know, you, you don't want to mess anything up. You don't want to mess anything up. You don't want to, but you do. That's the deal as a human. I heard, I heard more than one successful entrepreneur, um, and this is a little bit different domain, but I think it's cross domain applies. And then I'd like to maybe cut over to Carl because he had a comment. Maybe I'll let awesome. jump on Carl Lieberman. But um, that's what I want. If, if the business loses money, for example, you know, he's got a team of people and and maybe somebody makes a big mistake, you know, and they lose the business a lot of money and they're his employee, you know. Yes, you can fire that person. You can let them go. You can reprimand them. Um, you can handle it how you need to handle it. But he strongly advised to say, okay, we just paid, you know, it could be a million dollars. We just paid a million dollars to learn something. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> and, you know, if it's just about, we shouldn't have done that, you know, we shouldn't have lost that money. And, and uh, it's a huge mistake. And we need to get down on ourselves or get down on a per particular person, then you're going to, you're going to not just lose the money, you're going to lose the learning opportunity. And oh. so he would always consider that you've paid for a chance to learn something. Um, and I found that that's like a good, a good way to think about it. And again, he's talking sure. about on the hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. Yeah, he, that's he a think this way. fabulous fabulous context it's like i got in a lawsuit one time and you know it was far reaching consequences it was a completely made up lawsuit the my my adversarial you know the 
what do you call it, the plaintiff, just made a bunch of stuff up. Just whole cloth. No facts, no supporting documents, nothing. Just made a bunch of stuff. And um, you know, you have to deal with it. It cost me a bunch of money to finally learn to just, if there's some big client that's offering me to pay me big dollars, put their name in a search engine. Okay, that's what I learned for about, for a lot of money, thousands upon thousands of dollars. I just learned how to be simply <clears throat> careful. I'd never done that before. I'd never had to search anybody and make sure that they weren't a psychopathic, crazy person. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay, Carl. Okay, Carl, let's hit him. All right, uh, me, me. unmuted. Well, you're, so you're good. I, I think your observation about the um, partials coming together in the middle of the piano is a good observation. Yeah. True. It's true on well-scaled pianos. It's not true on right. poorly scaled pianos. Right. But one of the consequences of that, as you were saying, listening to an octave in the bass is a very poor way to tune bass notes. It's why I particularly like tenths and seventeenths or twelfths and nineteenths, because the partial, the five-one that you're listening to, or the six-four, or something like that, you're play you're playing partials that are in the mid-range. And it's a much better way to zero in the notes. But on poorly scaled pianos, what happens is you can't really tune clean octaves because the 4-2 partial pair and the 6-3 partial pair are not converging. When you tune a Steinway and you tune A2 to A3, you can tune a really clean octave. You can come at it through tenths. You can come at it any way, and they'll all be right. When you tune a really poorly scaled piano, you can't actually tune a clean octave between A2 and A3 because the 6-3 goes out, goes out of tune as the 4-2 comes into tune. And these are very loud partial pairs. So again, it's a, on poorly scaled pianos, you have to go to these larger compass intervals, but it's no guarantee that it's really gonna give you a good tuning in the bass. That's right. That's right. And say what Great you... Be a little bit more specific about confirming Ethan's statement that everything really comes together and becomes clear in the mid-range. So for instance, if you tune chromatic major 17th, which is I listen to as I go down through the bass, you're yep. doing fifth partial of the low of the bass note, which is right in the mid-range. It's right in the mid-range. And those partials tend to have a consistent inharmonicity and everything. Correct together right. so it's very good to listen to 17th it really is a, it's a it's a very very good tool okay or well, you know and 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 as i said i listen to 11515 that's so the most I. important interval for me but you've got you know two twelfths and 19th you've got a double octave you've got you know two double octaves you've got larger compass intervals but what you're listening to is partials that are in the mid-range of the piano that's right and, and when you get those sounds to sound, yeah, yeah, I'll take that. And after thousands of tunings, you just, that's a quick, that's a relatively fast process, right, Carl? To say, oh yeah, that's the best place it sounds on this piano in this timing and this day. And you make that decision and just keep going. And that's a beautiful thing. That's that's like a superpower. We're getting that light noise again. I'm not sure what it is. Oh, sorry. Um, You're good. I'm unconsciously messing with the bottom of my computer, which is right under the microphone. Very good. Um. Anyway, it's 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 empowering to be able to tune a piano. And that's one thing I wanna to say too, just, just 
let your body do the work. There's a guy that's Fred Riedekop up in Wichita, who's fantastic piano technician, like the damper king of Canada. Um, and does all the concert stuff for Winnipeg. And he said, we all think way too much. We need, just need to let our bodies do the work. Well, our bodies know how to do all this stuff. It's done it, we've done it thousands of times, hundreds of times. Our bodies are awesome, they know how to do it. Yeah, I think that's also good. I think when that most applies, if you are the type that's analytical, you know, and you've read this and you did that and you're listening to this partial, you're listening to that partial, it most applies when your head is just swimming with all the different things and that's you're right. saying, ah, oh, but I tried that, but I tried that. then that's it's right. very important. And that's when it's, it's almost should be an indicator for you when there's a lot of conflicting voices in your head to just as much as you can just go with what in, intuition at that point, those, yep. all those little pieces of information don't really matter anymore. Yep. In fact, they're distractions. So I was thinking, you know, lots more great questions, by the way, that we, we're Oh, like well, let's go with the questions. With comments. Let's, let's go with the questions, man. All right. So Always okay. just break in and aggressively go with the questions. Okay, great, great. Um, I'll share a private comment. I won't say who, who sent it. Suggestion, this is sort of unrelated to our topics, but I'll just share it because it seems, I don't know if it seems relevant or, or what. Uh, suggestion, when you give the pitch on master classes, that's to me privately, uh, consider doing it with professional integrity an announcer would use. Today, you did it sounding like you just wanted to be finished with it. <laughs> yeah well, i appreciate that feed i appreciate that feedback uh yeah i i, I want to say if that comes across i think it's more in the in the interest of getting to you know i think people are impatient they want to get get to what we're going to talk about today and so i really will take that note though uh, i do i am really excited and enthusiastic about piano technicians master classes i do think there's a ton of value there We've actually got some announcements today. I'll, I'll make them right now because we're on topic. One, a really cool online conference is coming in December. I'll be, we'll be planning that and putting that together. It's going to be three days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, December 10th, 11th, and 12th. Most likely that could change, but I think those are the dates. Um, so we'll, we'll probably have a minimum of 12 different speakers and uh, it's going to be awesome. So Keep, keep your ear to the ground for that. I'll give you ways to participate early so that, you know, if you're an early adopter, you can, you can make sure and get a special deal. And, and I'll just, you know, put the word out there soon. And then the other thing that's going on right now is we're ramping up our Piano Tech Mastermind group. And that is a group that actually meets uh, weekly, sort of like our Saturday session, but it's a private session. It's a small group. Right now, there's only... Uh, I think there's less than 10 people who are, who are eligible. So it's kind of a more small, dedicated group. David Anderson is going to be attending those every, right now it's on Tuesdays. I think we're at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And if you want to, if you want to attend those, you can sign up for master classes at the artisan level. So yeah, exciting stuff down the pike. And thank you for that note. And now I will continue That's the regular kind of programming. That's the kind of constructive feedback we love. That no BS kind that you just read. Much appreciated. Uh, next comment here, Jim Kelly. Maybe David can talk about his open string tuning. It's a wonderful and you know intimidating at first world, but very exciting of open string tuning. I, I love yeah. the concept. Yeah. It's, it's just an extension of what I was talking about before that I listen to the whole tone when I tune. I'm hearing all the partials that everybody's hearing and I'm hearing them match and be dissonant and then be back. I'll give a comment here as you, uh, as you straighten things out over there. I have tuned many different ways. And I'm, I'm, I have a very experimental personality. So as opposed to being having a consistent habit with each tuning, 
how uh-huh. the way that I keep it interesting is I'm always kind of experimenting and looking at things from a different angle. I'll, I'll quickly address another question, which was uh, temperament sequences. And I've found it very interesting to try different ones all the time to kind of balance my sense of how the temperament is put together. And so I'll try a new temperament could be from tuning to tuning or from week to week or, or month to month to get a different perspective on how things are put together. And then um, kind of trust my intuition from there sometimes as well. And uh, the, the, the other thing to head into is, yeah, I've, I've tuned with, with uh, a temperament strip going throughout the whole piano for all the way from the top to the bottom. I've experimented with the temperament strip just in the center. Um, what I do like about the open string tuning is the stability you under, I feel like the stability is a little bit easier to count on. Um, so there's a lot going on when you remove a temperament strip from uh, a bunch of strings and that can throw things out. You know, it, you can also think that a, a particular string is stable. You tuned it, but you tuned it, you know, you tuned it 30 minutes ago and then you can, you come up and somehow expect it to be where it was left off. I think when the piano, at least when the piano is very close to being in tune and you're doing a final pass, that open string um, has two major advantages in my opinion. And that is that one, you can trust a little bit more the stability that you, where you left that note is where it is because you've tuned the surrounding strings. Uh, and the other thing is what David is talking about is you really get a sense for the, the sound that's actually going to come through that particular note. So when I was a beginner, I would just tune the center strings, you know, tune the left to the right. I mean, some a, a novice or, or someone who's more of an electronic tuner might just say, well, let me just put them all at the same pitch according to the device, right? And that then they should all be in tune. And there, I've noticed there are just subtle differences to listening to the sound of all strings together and really thinking of it as a, as a whole, as a gestalt and tends to give whatever the tuning is, in my case, uh, a fuller, richer, more cohesive sound across the entire piano. And I'm checking with David. I'm not sure what happened. I think he, he might have, oh, here he is. He, here he comes right back. He must have had some sort of a snafu there. Um, I'm going to move on to a comment from Ed Whitting here and add a little comment to follow up with that. And let me just double check where David is, make sure he's available to unmute. Just one second, give me one second, folks. David Anderson, unmute. And make sure he's a co-host of this meeting. Okay, I'm gonna just throw in this comment from Ed Whitting. He said, George Deffenbaugh on Virgil Smith. Virgil is the finest piano tuner I have ever heard. To those who may not know, George taught tuning classes at PTG, PTG conventions for more than 30 years now. Two things about the Virgil Smith, and maybe many of you already know this, but there are two resources, and I don't know if I have the names, probably somebody could throw them in. One is a, a, a small little red book um, where he talks about his tuning sequence, and I found that invaluable and gives yet another perspective that I never came across before. Uh, where he does some tuning, not just in the temperament, but goes down to the, the D below F3 to sort of balance the balance out the transition there and do some interesting things there. And there's, there is a video, I believe, of Virgil Smith tuning on, on video, and that's a useful resource to just kind of listen to him tune a piano. I believe the PTG has that to, for order, but I'm not, I'm not positive. If any, let me see if anybody made a comment. Da, 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 da. No, nobody brought in those resources in the chat. So we'll see if we can get the names later. Welcome back, David. Are you Thank online? you. My computer just stopped. It was plugged yeah. in, plenty of charge, everything. Just It just quit. So here I am. I filled in um, a little bit talking about um, making some con- comments about... Ver- oh, yes. Nice. Thank you. Pooja, wow. Pooja, our assistant who knows, you know, very little about pianos has found a link for the book. Um, and that is uh, New Techniques for Superior Oral Tuning. 
and he, she put a, a link uh, through Amazon, but she just sent it to me. So I will put that in the chat and I highly recommend the book. It's very small, um, but it's got a lot of, it's just got a great methodology for tuning a piano. So, so go ahead and check that out. It's a fabulous book. I've been basically following it. And what I think advancing it for the past 35, 40 years. So I've gone to a point that's past Virgil in terms of looking at the fourths and fifths. And it's really important. And it's been for the past several years at least been fortified, ratified, and confirmed by both Dean Rayburn and Kent Swafford as gurus of the you know, analytical realm of tuning. They're basically ratifying to me that the way that I learned how to turn for, tune from Virgil and how I even refined that method in terms of the fourths and fifths and the stretches. Um, that that's exactly what a uh, quote ideal with in harmonicity equal temperament tuning sounds like and looks like that's the shape of it the architecture of it so and it turns out that that's what a pure 12 tuning is it's very simple it's extremely simple it's just listening to the tone of the piano and making certain things always occur. And the certain things, the three most certain things that always occur in any highly refined equal temperament and certainly a pure 12 temperament is the fact that the octaves are all stretched to some degree or another within the piano, swellingly beatless is what I call them. That's one great characteristic of pure 12, you know, high end oral tuning, I guess you could say. The other is that all of the fifths 12s, 19s are basically pure, basically sound pure. There's never a beat in the fifths on the piano, never. That's another huge component of high-end artisanal oral tuning, pure 12s tuning. Another, and this is the one that's been most controversial and I've had to prove over and over again. And I've sent people to read Swafford's treatise, long treatise, and especially the, the, the magazine where he gets into talking about the width of the th fourths and fifths in a, in a highly idealized, you know, equal temperament and all of the fourths on the piano fourths and elevenths and eighteenths have a slow roll in it and in the middle of the piano where it's everything is focused as we've said which is a great lead up to this the fourths beat a beat and a half a second yeah, 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 and a lot of people they listen to me tune a piano and say, "Oh my God, that's unacceptable." I said, "Just you can't hear it. Don't focus on it. Just listen to the music when I play this one four one, one four one one five. Listen." And um, it's true. This is the formula for a perfect 
pure 12 tuning for a high end artisan tuning. If all the fourths are beating wide, in this slow, calm, Pacific way, beat, beat and a half, and all the fifths are slightly contracted with absolutely no beat at all, not even any indication of a beat, just kind of a lean. If a beat is duh, I'm talking about duh, just a lean, just slightly contracted. And all of your octaves are swellingly beatless, stretched just slightly and different, different, obviously different, uh, different stretch lengths at different points of the piano, but basically all on that side. Those are the, those are the building blocks of a pure 12 temperament. Uh, temperament. Now you can get into other aspects of it, which Lieberman can, can get into and a lot of people can get into, but I mean, is anybody, I hope somebody can challenge or uh, have a conversation about what I'm saying. I'm challenging. Let's, uh, let's go back to some, we got a ton of comments today. Um, okay. Looks like we have big plans to talk about all kinds of stuff. We, we're getting through tuning and it's quite a quite an engaging subject. So right now I'll say that we have from Mark Steiger, he asked about our tuning sequences. Uh, we covered that a little bit, but Don Rose said, uh, in terms of tuning sequences, he suggested the self-correcting two octave temperaments such as Baldison and it looks like Sanderson, I think was that what that's supposed to sell, spell. And I don't know if he mentioned anything else, but there might be another one, Don, if you want to share it. Um, Brenda Ming said, David came to Santa Clara a few years ago for a technical talk. Thought one of the jewels of that talk was to play through all the octaves with the pedal down and listen. If you don't like what you hear, fix it. Um, Carl, we already spoke to him. And oh, your <laughs> sister's name. What's your sister's name, David? Uh, Erica, E R E R I K A, Erica Anderson. Erica Anderson. And of course, your brother's name is Kurt Anderson. He owns Studio 360, if you want to look up him too. Um, Dorothy, David, please give an example. <laughs> Here's a great question. I think, I think you love to share stuff like this and, and maybe we've done this before in episodes, but let's just go there. David, please give an example of a piano you messed up. <laughs> Are you up for it? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. The most egregious example was at the very beginning of my, like maybe four years in, um, and I had started to work for Sherman Clay, which was the largest Steinway dealer in the world at that time. They had like 48 stores all over the Western United States and um, Steinway franchises. And I went to uh, solve an issue on a Steinway upright. And the issue was, you know, the butts were tight. So instead of, I was just ignorant. Instead of repinning or easing or doing anything like that, I just reamed. <laughs> Reamed the hole. I reamed the hole in the part. Uh, that the uh, that the uh, the center pin went through, right? And completely fucked up the piano, and they had to send Richard Davenport out. To, that was my first. That's my first experience with the dark side of Richard Davenport or any side of Richard Davenport. 
He said, who is this idiot they sent out there with no training? And he was right. I was an idiot with no training. And I had made a stupid mistake. That's about the most egregious mistake I can remember. Oh, uh, I completely messed up a piano right before a concert. About 15, 18 years ago, maybe 20, 22 years ago, actually. It was a house, big house concert in a big, rich LA house with a, I don't know, a, a Hamburg C or maybe a Hamburg D. And um, somebody had retrofit some hammers on, on it that were soft hammers, more like Steinway, American Steinway hammers. And um, somebody lacquered the hell out of them. And, you know, the problem was I didn't talk to the artist. And so my, me, me and my hubristic, hey man, I know what pianos sound like, way, thought that the attack was too strong on the piano in, the, in octave five and six and seven. Just it's too strong, man. So I took that attack out of there by whatever technique I was using at the time of making the strike point softer, probably just needling in the string cuts, just straight down from the top. I don't know what I was doing. I, I, I can't remember. And, um, or maybe I was just needling high in the shoulders. I don't know. Anyway, I got it down to this awesome sound that I loved. I just loved it. And then um, got finished and the artist came back and she was all happy because she was liking this piano sat down and played it and her eyes went from love and collegiality to coldness. And she looked up at me and she said, you ruined this piano. You took the life out of it. That was intense. And I, uh, I got him back up, but she was pissed. I got him back up to pretty much what they were, but she didn't care. I, I wounded her, her instrument. And so, man, did I learn a ton from that that has served me incredibly well for the last 20 odd years. Number one, don't change the voicing on a piano between <laughs> rehearsal and performance unless the artist is right there, ever, never, ever. And if you do change anything that is obvious to the piano technician, which usually has to do with tone or attack, don't do it without them. Just don't, just don't do it. I'll, I'll, I'll share something that probably gonna seem a lot milder, but it was a big turning point for me. Um, I used to kind of just be a tuner guy and you know, when I was starting out and if there were ever repairs needed, I would just say, I can't do that. Let's find you someone else. Sometimes I just kind of leave them hanging or they just have to find someone to fix something. Um, and up, up to a certain point, I believe I, I either, I must've broken bass strings. I don't know. I've, and I must've just referred them to someone else. I had been working for dealers. Maybe we got someone else from the dealership, but I, I broke a bass string at someone's house and I, I didn't warn them about it. You know, that's really useful to do. And if, if, if you break a string and, and you don't tell them that that's something that can happen, you get in an awkward spot where, you know, 
even if it's not your fault, it could seem like it is. And I remember breaking a bass string and I just remember asking myself the question, are you really after this many years of tuning gonna continue to not know how to splice a bass string? You know, I, I, somebody had showed me how to do it previously. I had done it in various situations, but, and I, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna finally learn how to do this. And, um, and it was, it's hard to get over the, it's hard to get over the, um, the momentum to get into to doing that. But I did it, you know, I went back, I paid for the string, I volunteered for the service of putting it in. It was a upright spin it piano. Uh, so I had to take the action out. I had to do all kinds of work to make that happen. But I, I learned how to splice a bass string and I did a good job, you know, and I got better at it even. So, uh, but it was embarrassing in the moment for sure when that happened. Um, let's see here. I'm going to go back. Thank you for sharing, David, as well. Um, going back to the open string tuning topic, somebody, we didn't really get to talk about that. Did you have anything you wanted to share, David, about your open string tuning uh, methodologies? And sure. Why do it? Yeah. Um, and I've already talked about it now. I'll talk about it until I'm blue in the face. Um, it's better to hear the piano and to get into the, the context, the atmosphere, the feeling, the vibration, the practice of listening to the piano, how the player hears it, how the listener hears it, how everybody else in the whole world hears it other than a piano tuner. And that's what Virgil always said, you know, uh, listen to it like other people listen to it. What does it sound like? And use, use your body as much as you can because it's a much, it's an incredibly well-designed instrument to hear with and to feel with, and to sense and perceive with. Um, so open string just means using a mute, basically, to tune with, not using a temperament strip, letting everything ring. For instance, when I tune the temperament, I tune A, three, and I tune the right string, then the center string to the right string, then the left string to the center string, and then take the string out, uh, take the mute out and see what I got. And if it sounds like one big fat still note, then I'm good, you know? And my ears know what that sound sounds like, you know? My ear knows what a piano sounds like on a recording when it's like incredibly well in tune with all the unisons just feeling so fat and round and real and resonant. You know, that's what open string tuning will bring you. It'll bring you a whole other level of perception, attention, and focus because you have no, if you're tuning open string, then you have to listen. You have to listen to the mistakes. Look, the reason I quit using a temperament strip is because I was frustrated when I pulled it out and pulled the left string and right string back up to, you know, where I had set the center string, which was, in my, you know, work like protocol, an idealized, pretty idealized tuning, it would shift, would subtly shift because bringing those side strings up, if they were more than a center two down, or even if they were a center two down, would subtly shift the pitch of the center string it would usually go down a little bit. 
it would move. And so it wasn't precise. So now when I get done with an equal temperament, when I get done setting a highly idealized equal temperament, it stays where I set it. It's like a little mini pitch raise. And I only use that, that one mute. Um, I use two mutes when I teach so that people can hear the beats, both the rapidly occurring beats and the slowly occurring beats, right? Um, but when I tune, I use one mute and I hear everything. And then I'm going, I'm, I'm taking that beautiful, solid, as solid as it can be in a piano temperament. And I'm, and I'm spreading it over the rest of the piano, making sure that all of the octaves are slightly stretched, swellingly beatless right? And that all the fourths and elevenths and eighteenths are, have roll to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all the fifths sound basically pure. And if that keeps going, and I can also use you know, thirds marching down, tenths, seventeenths. Seventeenths is a great tool. I agree with Carl. Carl's taught me a ton about oral tuning, and he calls himself a cyber tuner. It's bullshit. He's an oral tuner that is has become a hybrid tuner, which is oral and machine. As much as he wants to tell you about the sing the glories of the cyber tuner. There's the glories of Carl Lieberman's ears too. Don't forget about that. So in combination. We're, yeah, uh, we're right. very close to the end here, David. So let me let you know that. Really? <clears throat> yeah. Damn. It's just yeah. flown it's past. Okay. So I'll any other any other questions? Any other burning questions? Uh, there's one uh, maybe we'll get to, maybe not. I want to highlight a couple things just because they came in the chat. One, uh, we did find the link for Virgil to, uh, Virgil's book, right? Uh, New Techniques for Superior Oral Tuning. But I also found a link on the PTG website to his DVD, which is called Oral Tuning, a Masterclass. And it looks like part of the proceeds, uh, if you buy that DVD, I think it looks like it was only like I don't know, it was like 30 bucks or something. Part of the proceeds go to some a scholarship fund um, for the Chicago chapter. Um, so that's kind of nice. Might as well pick it up. Quite, It's a great deal. I would I recommend it. Uh, I also put a, link, a couple of links to David Anderson's classes. Uh, the two we have on file, specifically the one from 2019 is the tuning concert. So you can watch, just watch David tune a piano. So if you were confused about you know, what is he talking about on his open string tuning techniques and how does that all go? Um, just watch. All you got to do is watch and listen. You can watch as many times as you want. So uh, that link is in there as well. I will uh, and, make sure. Yeah. And if you listen over a set of headphones or on a really good set of speakers, you can hear everything, man. This is high definition audio. So you can actually hear what I'm doing which is massive. Uh, thank you for sharing that, David. And in terms of other links, yeah, just, just the ones we put in there about signing up for direct access uh, for just eight bucks a month, support this project and you'll get our links directly and you'll always be pre-registered and you get recordings on file, so on and so forth. Um, I don't know if saying so on and so forth appeals to, uh, to the earlier comment. <laughs> but that resource we have on file. And finally, I haven't promoted this too much, but we do have an Instagram account. Um, if you're interested in following us on Instagram, do that. We've, we're posting some, some cool content there. And we're at about one minute to the end of the hour. So there's definitely questions left and I'm super intrigued. You know, we, we had so many things we thought we might cover, but we really went deep on tuning. And I, I think that was, that was useful. The feedback link is in the chat. If you didn't think it was useful, let us know. <laughs> we 
we could talk about other stuff another time. But um, but yeah, thanks everyone for joining. David, I'll let you say any last words if you have any things to. Well, the wisdom of these things is not me or Ethan, it's the room. And I'd love to do these again. I'd love to do these occasionally because they're super valuable, feels like. And I want the, the, the wisdom of the room. I, I'm looking in all your faces and seeing hundreds of years of experience. And I want to hear your experience of what it's like for you to listen to a great piano tuning and then try to emulate it or get there or whatever. I want to hear. I want to hear what my colleagues, my brothers and sisters go through. I, I, I just think that's incredibly valuable information. So thank you so much for being here today. Had a great time. And it seemed like about 10 minutes or 15 minutes instead of an hour. And thank you. Thank you for your focus. This is an amazing community. Appreciate it. See you down the road. Right. See you guys next week. Bye.